Hi, I'm Marty Haas. And I'm Martine Bernard. And this is Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books. lollies and belly bones. I know what you're up to. <laughs> yeah, you know me and funny words. I love them. Well, that's extremely appropriate for today's show because we're going to be hearing from guests who are going to help us put life into words, writing them down to be sung, digging deep into our thoughts to come up with our own poetry, and bringing them to life when reading aloud. And to celebrate putting life into words, I thought I'd share some of our English language's lost words that I found in this book, Pop Lollies and Belly Bones by Susan Kells Sperling. In the Nile, he tripped over zooks, spiss with mally mal shaves that made him quetch at their touch. Just in case you didn't get that, let me translate. He said, in the fog, he tripped over tree stumps, thick with speckled caterpillars that made him shiver at their touch. Interesting. Bringing words to life is what our first guest chef, Audrey Lepinen, does as a Boston children's librarian. Audrey is reading to children at the South Boston Neighborhood House. Beautiful. What is it, they whispered. Whoever can that be? It was Asraboa the monkey going to get the drum. He hoped Osibo wouldn't see him behind his mask. Arr, looking for me, Osraboa. Audrey, you obviously enjoy reading aloud to kids. Yes, I do. They're fun. We encourage parents to use voices, but sometimes they're reluctant. What do you say to parents to encourage them to use voices and, and, and to encourage them to realize how easy it is? Well, when I started telling stories to children, as I said, it was a little hard because I didn't really know what to do. But a lot of it is feeling stupid. And once you become an adult, you're very, very afraid to just appear stupid. So if you can get over that a little bit and realize that it's playful and it's fun, and if you're sharing books with children, then you get feedback from them. They will laugh. They won't laugh at you because you're stupid. They will laugh at you because you're making the book funny. And that makes a big difference. So I think that what parents need to do is just learn that it's play. A lot of it is just play. And if they like the book, they will figure out a way to make it come more alive by the way they read it. Froggy, called his mother. What, yelled Froggy. Did you forget to put something on? Froggy looked down. Oops, cried Froggy. I forgot to put on my pants. <laughs> I forgot my pants. <laughs> you kept a group of four and five year olds attentive for almost an hour. Oh. How do you increase that attention span? How did you, what do you recommend to parents for making sure that they can start to grow it like a small seed and then get it longer and longer so that the attention span grows? Well, one mistake I've seen parents make is that I've, you know, you tell them to read to children, and I've seen them sit down with them, maybe in the library, when the child just is not in the mood <laughs> and is not going to listen to anything. And I don't care whether you're Carol Burnett, this child is not going to listen to you. So the important thing is to get the child at the right time. And usually just before bed is a really good time because you've, they've got your total attention and you've got their attention and everything is quiet. And if you do it when it's the right time and it's a positive, fun experience, they'll want you to keep doing it. You used a fascinating technique. You used a puppet mm. to introduce a book. Mm. And it really drew the children into the story even before you introduced the story. Is so do you real? want me to get him out? We'll see. Okay. Yeah. You all yell here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Kitty, kitty, kitty. 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 
Well, that didn't go very well, did it? <laughs> okay, well, we can try it again. I'll, I'll count to three and you stay here, kitty, kitty. One, two, three. Okay, how about if we learn how to make friends with a cat? How about that? And then maybe we'll do better. Now, I'm going to very, very carefully reach around the cat. <coughs> okay, now, we'll leave him in there until we find out how to make friends with a cat. There are stories that just kind of almost beg for puppets. Um, this one was Leave Herbert Alone, and there's a cat in it that's just such a character. And I know cats very well because I have four. So I know how they act and how they react. And um, I just wanted to make this story a really fun experience and try to teach children how to deal with cats. And if a cat starts out unfriendly, this is what you have to do. And the girl in the story is just overwhelmingly enthusiastic about loving the cat. And cats don't like that very much. <laughs> They're very reserved. So uh, making, uh, well, and actually I came across this puppet in a store and the minute I saw its face, I thought, yeah. Because <laughs> this cat can, <laughs> and this cat can look goofy. It's not too scary. It has a funny face and it can make a lot of different expressions. <laughs> So if I try and reach over and, ooh, I see. Because she doesn't know you, <laughs> and that's a bit rude. <laughs> Here, kitty, kitty. Whereas if you have a piece of tuna fish, ah, well, and you sit very still. Fish, yes, yes, in my, in my mm, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. a good way to make friends with a cat. Right, right. So as you say, you have to be able to put aside the adult reserve That's right. in order to have fun with puppets That's right. and children's books. And a very nice thing is that in a lot of bookstores, in most bookstores, along with the children's books, they sell puppets and they sell props and they sell little, the little characters that are in the stories. So if you can get one of those, especially if it's a puppet, but even if it's not, it goes together with the book and you can have fun making a character out of this thing that comes from the book. So it enlarges the book and you can expand the book and you can have more fun with the book that way. So I love to use puppets and I love to use props, but you don't need to. You've also gotten very easy at doing multiple voices. Mm -hmm. How did you get to that? I think because I started doing puppets. And if you're going to make a puppet play out of a book or a story, then the whole story or book becomes characters speaking or talking or interacting and that's what you have to make it into so once you're used to doing that to a certain extent and you go back to books you see that in the stories and some stories do that more easily than others but i like the stories that have a lot of that in them just make characters become real you know monty i'm having a little easier time getting into character after watching audrey lepinen wasn't she great with that hand puppet and those character voices. Say, Martine, I've never seen you so much in character. Well, this is a case that it takes one to know one, Monty. And actually, here are a few more characters you know. The Cookie Bookie Bears are helping Lori Joy by playing a game together. I think you ought to keep your orange hair, Martine. Thanks, Pumpkin Beak. <laughs> Honey and Chip are with me today. You want to say hi, guys? to help me demonstrate how to create a fun reading and spelling activity from a favorite book like My Daddy and Me by Jerry Spinelli. Got any ideas? Drum. Okay, write drum. What they're doing is remembering some of the words they just heard as we enjoyed the story together. What else? Hide. Okay, write hide. Mess? Tickle. Okay, right tickle. Hammer. Okay. 
Russell. I thought you guys would get that one. What they're going to do now is think about their list while I read the story. When we find a word that's on their list, we'll look at how it's spelled and write it again. I say to my daddy, what did you bring me? Sometimes he pulls out an apple or a toy. And sometimes he says, I brought you me. Daddy and I wrestle on the living room rug. Wrestle. OK, let's look at it. Write W, R, E, S, T, L, E. Now, when they're done, they'll have a whole list of correctly spelled vocabulary words and their own pronunciation guide. What's this word, honey? Poop. <laughs> Have you ever written a song, Monty? Not yet. Am I about to? Yes, you are. And here's something to get you started. Just put words to this rhythm. Row, row, row your no, boat gently down. No, try something of your own. Put your own words in it. Sink, sink, sink your boat gently down. Well, that's a start, but if you're watching and you're not a songwriter, you and your child can take familiar rhythms and put your own words to it. Great idea, but I can hear our parents wondering, where do I get original lyrics from? Well, I was talking to a singer-songwriter who has a band called Ben Rudnick and Friends, and they specialize in family-friendly music. So I asked Ben where his lyrics come from, and he told me something about his songs and his daughter, Emily. Well, the, the lyrics we um, usually come up with together just stem out of things that we do every day. Like our song, I Need a Hand, you know, the lyric is, I need a hand when I'm crossing the street, all came out of Emily and I crossing the street to go to school every morning. So then the lyrics continue, get up in the morning, getting ready for school. Uh, so it's all everyday stuff. So somewhere in Washington, D.C., you know, on a copyright registration form is Emily's name, you know, next to mine, which is really a neat thing. It's really, a, I mean, it, you know, you look at Emily's name, she's seven and a half, and her name's listed on probably three separate, three or four or five separate copyrights. Will she read books about music, do mm. you find, I, or is it just creating, a lot of just creativity? She'll create her own lyrics, or? She will create her own lyrics, you know, and, um, you know, last week we sat down, we actually we wrote a song that was going through her head, and um, it's, I don't think it's going to be a hit anytime soon because, you know, so much of what kids find humorous, you know, sometimes has to do with the bathroom, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, you know, me and my compadres probably won't be singing, singing about the bathroom. At it. You know, I, I know <laughs> some guys do have songs about it, um, and maybe I could sculpt one out, but the particular song we wrote last week, but it was so much fun. I mean, you know, anything that a parent and a kid can do together, you know, even if it's listening to our music, yes. you know, it's a, it's a bond. It's something to connect people with, families from the oldest to the youngest. Would you mind sharing one of your songs with us? No. Because I'm very Cause I've got this excited guitar right to hear here. something. Uh, this is the song I told you about with the um, I Need a Hand crossing the street. So. Um. Get up in the morning, getting ready for school. Gotta get some clothes on, gotta look real cool. Put on my socks, put on my shoes. The only thing I need now, I'll never confuse. I need a hand, hand when I'm crossing the street. I need a hand, hand, a hand can't be beat. I look to my left, I look to my right. Oh, when you give me a hand, everything's all right. Yeah, and we do that, and then we do the fun stuff at the end. I need a penguin. Oh, when I'm crossing the street, I need a penguin. Oh, we do uh, the last one is, I need a cupcake. Oh, when I'm crossing the street, I need a cupcake. <laughs> And then we'll ask the kids to uh, tell us what they need to cross the street. And, and sometimes, sometimes the kids need a crossing guard. You know, <laughs> just, but sometimes a kid will come out and tell me they need a hamburger, you know, or, or they need a milkshake, or they need you know, a crayon, so, or their stuffed animal or their dog. So it's a lot of fun, and it gets the kids involved in what we're doing as we're doing it. Do, 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 do.
So what you doing there, Martine? Well, Monty, you're not the only one around here who can come up with surprises. Well, that's all very interesting, but what are you planting? Have patience, you'll see. Remember how we opened up the show with lost words? Yes, like Mally Mal shaves, the speckled caterpillars. Well, I was just going to tell our viewers our next guest chef is a poet, educator, and freelance writer who's worked with both children and adults to help them find words. He guides them to put their ideas and feelings into poems. His name is Stephen Routiner, and actually the surprise that I've been working on is also for him. Well, now you have my full attention, so what have you been planting? It's very rare. It's a poet tree. <laughs> Don't open your eyes yet. I'm going to hide the sound maker. Okay, open your eyes. Quickly, begin to write. Whatever you saw in your mind, wherever you went, set it down. One, two, three, four images, whatever you've got. You put it down quick. And then we'll read some out loud. Stephen, at Winthrop School, you had parents and kids writing together. Is that the norm? No, but I wish it, it was something that happened more often in schools. Uh, it's something that maybe the parents can uh, see happen at home. When the parent and the child are writing together, first of all, you are comrades in this enterprise. It's not as if one knows and the other one doesn't. You both can say, we're going to learn about this together. We will use poetry as a way of learning more. It's not as if I, as the adult, already have this, and I'm going to pass it on to you. We are learning poets. I've been writing poetry since I was eight and a half, and that's many decades ago, and I'm still a learning poet. And in fact, if ever there is a time in my life when I'm not still learning about poetry, learning about my craft, or using it to learn something about what's around me in, in the world, I'd say I probably have stopped becoming a good poet. Should parents correct a child's poem? Um, sometimes in schools, they will, they will uh, w fret about this idea of correction. And, and, you, and you're right to, because you don't want to feel like the, the child is being censored. In school, where kids are ultimately aware of being evaluated, being measured. You'd like that to be a place where anything can happen and there's no judgment uh, uh, involved. A great poet, William Stafford, used to say, you have to write as if this is only for you. Nobody else in the universe will ever see it unless you actually like the result and choose to share it. I would, though, once you get to the sharing stage, I'd be as honest and as direct as you can. Patting a child on the head, oh, I like what you wrote, kids will often sense that's what mom always says. That's what dad always says. But if you can say, I love that opening line because it made me think of, and that middle part, that one image was, but I'm not so sure at the end. What did you mean by? Now, I'm questioning. I'm willing to examine. That's taking the child as a peer. We together as two poets are going to figure out how to make this work. By asking good, careful questions, the child gets to go back and examine. Where is the poem strongest? Where do I want it to work a bit further? And then both poet and, uh, I'm sorry, and then both parent and child will grow as writers. A band or a, wh or a whoopee cushion playing softly or a robin singing. And what was the very first thing you said? A band. A band? Yeah. Like a musical like, band? Yeah. Playing softly? Mm -hmm. This band, what did they look like, this band? They had good musical instruments. Uh, the instruments, make me see the instruments. What were they? Like guitar, guitars and flutes. Excellent. The more you see, the more your reader sees. As he keeps on going inside and expanding that little moment, show it to us. That's how you would have kept on going with the poem. It's a wonderful beginning, too. Singing red and black feathers in a nest, in a tree, in a forest, sun shining down, a nice song, slow and soft. I love hearing that song. Who was in the, in the tree, did he say? Did he say bird? He didn't say bird, but you said the feathers of the, of the creature. Is that right? And when you said that, I'm picturing the bird singing that song in the tree. We had a bird, we had a snake, we had trees and a siren. What else do we have now? We had the top of the mountain, the wind blowing. What, was, what else did I forget? Crickets. What was that? Crickets. Oh, crickets again in the trees. And what? Um, a band or a robin singing. The band or a robin singing. All of this from one sound maker. We got one more. Let's try another one. What did you hear? You don't want to? You don't have to. You decide when you're ready to share. Like I said, if it were my poem, I can make her share. It's not my poem. It's her poem. But my hope is this. If you end up doing one you like, then maybe you want to share. Would one of our adults want to share? Want to be brave? A long field, something flying over me, trying to take over the field. All of a sudden, 
lights all over the place, sound, someone walking to me, and it was game time. <laughs> Did you expect that as the ending of this, too? At first, it was kind of scary, almost like, a, like an alien invasion. <gasps> oh, now I suddenly see where I am. When we were at the Winthrop School, one of the things that did amaze me was that you brought that central stillness. In, in our harried lives, particularly parents, when they've got soccer games and, and music lessons and school reports and everything else that they have to either get their kids to or help them with, how do you help the parent find that central stillness? One thing is I, I tell uh, the adults that you have to understand that you deserve this. Sometimes we think, do I dare take this five minutes alone sitting out in the garden? I love the fact that every morning barefoot, my wife is out in the garden inspecting that little quiet world before she even starts to think about dressing and heading to the work day. So I would say you have to look for the little tiny moments in which you can have that. The second thing is you can build these into the, into the hectic day. You know, you can find the makings of poetry um, on that trip on the way to the soccer game. Coming back from the game and discussing one moment that was the high point of the game on the shopping trip and examining the world. So you might find the ways that, that our everyday lives are containing such rich material that we can now focus the, on the, for the poems. And then the third thing is always, especially with younger children, although it shouldn't be too young, bedtime. Is there a time when we're getting quieter at the end of the night when we want to read together? And if you say, we're going to have one poem a night, so it doesn't feel like it's school at all, this is just one little bit of pleasure before you go to bed, or maybe with the bedtime story. To have one poem a night is to eventually have an inner anthology of poets' voices, and that one little still point inside the poem, after a while, starts to create a parallel place inside of you. I can hear a parent saying, what poetry do I start with? Help, help. What would you recommend? Well, I have to say, I don't say to, to parents to just concentrate on the quote, quote, children's poets. Children's poetry publishing is sometimes very conservative. And I would say they have to find the poets, the great poets, who speak to themselves. And in the work of any great adult poet, there's always one, two, three poems that also will speak to your eighth grader, fourth grader, first grader. So, in fact, I would say the best resource is to look for poetry anthologies first. Um, there are several wonderful ones. I was thinking of uh, uh, anthologists who consistently find amazing work for um, uh, students of all uh, age levels. Someone like Richard Lewis, who combs uh, through Asia and all around the world to find poetry. Naomi Shihab Nye, who does the same thing also for middle school and high school students. Um, these are people who read so much for you that they can find the one or two poems from, from poets that are really substantial that you can share with your students. These are poets that will help them to grow. These are the best models because they will challenge them to go deepest inside poems. So the anthologist gives you a, a, a wide panorama. You find some of the ones that please you the most, and those are the ones that you start with with your kids. Stephen, I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation on future shows. It's a delight. Thanks. Now let's review the highlights of today's show. Audrey Lepinen says, read when your child can listen and bring puppet voices to your reading. Lori Joy suggests playing reading and spelling games based on stories. Stephen Retiner suggests become learning poets. Find great poets that speak to you and enjoy one poem a night. Like Ben Rudnick, make up songs with your children. Now, here's Mary Marichak's recommended words that cook book list brought to you with the help of the cookie bookie bears for zero to three sing-along songs by mary ann hoberman pete's a pizza by william steig for three to six a tisket a tasket by ella fitzgerald Rap-a-tap-tap, -tap, here's Bojangles. Think of that, by Leo and Diane Dillon. And the Usborne Book of Everyday Words with Clay Models by Joe Litchfield. For six to nine, The Honest to Goodness Truth by Patricia McKissick. Autumn Blings. Poems and Paintings by Douglas Florian. And The Wonderful Happens by Cynthia Ryland. And 
for 9 to 12, Frindle by Andrew Clements. And The Night Has Ears by Ashley Bryan. For a complete list of books, including those mentioned by our guests today, related activity ideas, and links that will help make reading more fun for your kids, go to our website, wordsthatcook.org. Now you've got some new ideas to play with, so go and have some fun with Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books in, in your, your kitchen. kitchen.